Welcome to Radar in Action of the Fraunhofer Institute for High Frequency Physics and Radar Techniques, FHR. My name is Jens Fiege. As every week, we broadcast live from Wachtberg near Bonn in Western Germany. Today, we are talking again about SAR, Synthetic Aperture Radar. As you probably already know, the SAR method can be used to generate images of the ground independent of daylight and weather conditions. These are important capabilities for reconnaissance. Last week, we used the vehicle as platform for our 300 gigahertz radar. This week, we show what is possible with a 94 gigahertz radar on an airplane. And if you also fly in a circle around the target area, you get a lot more information, which you don't get with the usual ZAR configuration. For example, you can see moving vehicles and people. How does it work? What do the results look like? My colleague Stefan Palm answers these questions now in his presentation. Yeah, welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Stefan Palm. I'm from the Department of High Frequency Radar. So this talk will be about a very high frequency sensor concept uh, applied on an airborne circular SAR platform to monitoring to monitor urban scenes. So I've got lots of stuff, so let's start. What was the basic idea behind this project, uh, this research? As radar is always a time critical sensor, we wanted to have like a high re resolution dynamic 360 degree situational awareness of a significant target area. So just, just really a spot. And this should be done at any time, at day and night or at any weather conditions and in the form of images and in the form of a video format. And the whole sensor concept should be realized on a small airborne platform. Some more scientific questions were, uh, which re resolution is practically achievable in this kind of geometry and frequency band? And to what extent can moving vehicles be detected or to what extent can we extract 3D information? So let's start with some advantages and disadvantages about circular SAR. So you may know linear SAR, but in circular SAR, you have the benefit that you have really a 360 degree spotlight mode. So if you are searching for hidden targets, you usually find a favorable viewing angle to, to track them. Um, you can collect and evaluate echoes over a very large aspect range. And you can, you can use this information to, to either push your resolution in both dimensions or you can you can you can process like ultra multi aspect images from all aspect angles to detect 3D or even to detect moving objects. The most challenges are usually, especially in our frequency domain, uh, we have a much more de de demanding flight track for the pilot with low output power in our frequency domain. So the pilot has to fly very low at the moment, tight radii, and so we have an unstable flight attitude. Um, we have to realize some kind of beam stabilization, otherwise it won't work. And of course, the whole sensor concept is much more, it's much more system requirements because you want to have a wide beam, to have a wide spot, but then you need a high PRF and you want also to have a high bandwidth and that's all very challenging. So how did we realize the beam stabilization problem? So we basically installed our radar front end in a mechanical mount, which is like a, like a gimbal system and then we developed a software framework where we extract our, in real time, our GPS IMU data. We calculate the best solution for the mount, giving commands back to the, to the mount to stabilize the antennas. And then the uh, beam will be fixed on a certain GPS coordinate so that we can collect the data. So this is how the system, system looks like. So we have the front end installed in our mount or in our gimbal system. That's a picture of how the whole SAR sensor is installed beneath the wing, so front end, back end antennas. Then we basically just close the pod and then we are ready to fly. All the system is installed in this pod and it's a weight of 25 kilos. So here, first test about our beam stabilization method. So in red, you can see the flight track of the, of the plane. In the center, you see our institute with our big radar. And when I plot like our illumination pattern from, from this uh, measurement, 
you can nicely see that while well, it's working and we can collect 360 degree data regardless of the flight track. Here again, to give you an impression about how a measuring campaign looks like in a circular mode, I have on the left side an unstabilized flight and on the right side a stabilized flight. And you can, you can uh, nicely see when I put off the gimbal mode or the stabilization mode, then the, the rolling angles and the drift angles and the yaw angles, uh, they, are, they are too high to really keep the antenna fixed on a given uh, GPS position like the commercial buildings were like the center of our circle. But you see when I put, put, put on the gimbal mode and we are able to, to keep the antenna fixed to this position. So it makes much more sense than to process these data. Yeah, the sensor in operation, how, this, how does this looks like? So we usually have two people on the ground then we have two laptops or three laptops there, and then we have a data channel, uh, a data transmission to our uh, radar sensor, to the sensor pod, and we are in remotely, we can remotely control the whole SAR system. We can change parameters, we can set the mount to different modes, we can set new GPS coordinates, of course, and we we are also able to like to monitor the system, and we have a low resolution real-time SAR application as well. So the pilot only has to fly, we can control the system uh, remotely. And the data transmission has a data link of, I think it's 40 kilometers, so that's pr pretty nice. Yeah, here to show you how the sensor is working in a stabilized linear SAR mode, just to give you an impression how good uh, the focusing quality is of this sensor concept at 94 gigahertz, six gigahertz bandwidth, three centimeter resolution. If I zoom in in some places here in this urban area here, for example, we have high resolution, high contrast, or here in the more speckle area, we can even we are even able to to track like the the tires of a of a tractor profile of, of a profile of the tractor tires here, for example, that's possible. Or here, parts of our institute. I don't know if you can see this right, but we positioned there two two ladders on a round table and we are able to like count each each step of the of the ladder there. Here again, good contrast of a parking place or here you can see different layers of asphalt. Mm, you can even see gully covers coming coming through the image. Um, volume scatterers are nicely represented and you can even see the paving stones coming up if I zoom if I zoom more in. You have street lamps visible, so the resolution is really, really good. So two slides uh, about the signal processing aspect, just to give you, to give you some, some, some facts about this, how this is done. So of course, as a linear SAR, we want to solve the line integral. We want to coherently process our data. And in circular SAR, um, if I plot the whole spectrum of one single point scatter, for example, in this case, um, if I could process it, I would be able to get a resolution about the wavelength domain. So we are lambda divided by four. So in our case, it would be one millimeter resolution. So pretty, pretty high. We end up with some Bessel functions then. But in practical, that's not really possible because you usually don't see your target at 360 degree and you can't process coherently a full track at 94 gigahertz. So it's not does not make sense, so much sense. So that's why in our case, we split up the, um, the signal spectrum in hundreds of subbands because at 94 gigahertz, you only need like one degree or even below of aspect integration to, to are able to image 10 centimeter resolution. So we are simply splitting up the spectrum and we are processing hundreds of images and we're building up an image stack in a georeferenced uh, space more or less. And then we can play them as videos. So this is just to give you, I just want to focus on these two plots here. Um, here to give you to give you a feeling about the height sensitivity in circular SAR. As in linear SAR, you might know, if you do not know the exact uh, height of your target, the, this doesn't affect your res resolution. But in circular SAR, height is very sensitive to resolution. So on the left side, I'm going to show you how a target that's which height is perfectly known, then of course, the more aspect integration you choose, 
the better your resolution will be. But in urban scenarios, you will have uh, a scatterer on the ground or at the roof or on a tree, and you don't know it in uh, a priori. And for example, here, if you have a scatterer at 10 meter height, you could only process it to a resolution about 10 or 12 centimeters, even if you have the perfect track information. And this uh, information is uh, collected here in this Vmax, which gives you the level, the angle of coherency for objects above the reference height. Just to keep in mind. Here I'm going to show you my first uh, circular star video. So this is probably the first video you can see at 94 gigahertz. You see a small village next to our institute. And in the center, there is a small church. And you can nicely see how the like the sensor is, is changing its aspect angle and the shadow is moving of all objects and the, the, the roofs and the well, like the scatterers, they are flashing up and flashing down depending on the uh, incidence angle and the uh, aspect angle, of course. And you can see that the whole scene is more or less, more or less moving. All objects are, are turning around and the scatterers are moving on the image plane. That's because you're basically imaging uh, 3D topography on a 2D map. So I show this again to give you a little bit of time. Uh, I put them all on YouTube as well, so you can find them just giving, I think, Airborne Circular W Band SAR, you can find them. And um, you may know that if, if we are able to track all this movement then, then we are able to, to detect like height information. That's what I'm going to show you later. Now I want to focus you on this area here. Here, you see a small shadow. And now he's he's walking away, and that's that's a person at the graveyard here in the north. And you are even even able to detect like walking persons. Now he's going to the exit, and you are able to track them in the SAR videos. So here again, height sensitivity. If I choose a very long aspect integration, so very long means eight degree already in our frequency domain. And I put the focusing height at the street level, so at zero meters. Then you see the street level is in focus, the cars are in focus, even the gully covers or the street paintings are coming out. But the roof, of course, is in this focus. And if I put the focusing height, let's say at 12 meters, then the height is in focus, but the street will be in this focus. Here again, same statement, uh, but for point scatter, again, left side zero meters, right side 10 meters. So if you have very low aspect integration, you will have like the same po point spread function. But if you choose a higher integration, then you can reach, for example, here two centimeters resolution, which is really, really high. But if you have the wrong height, you will be at one meter resolution. So this is really bad. So let's change the topic a little bit, going to more into the, the dynamics of the scene. So um, as you may know, in SAR, you're assuming that the scene is static that you are imaging. And if there is an object which is not static, then it will be disfocused and it will cause like a small shadow place. And if we now have in our example um, at W band, we have a synthetic aperture buildup time of 0.2 seconds, for example, that's already enough to generate 10 centimeter resolution images. And we assume a car driving with 40 kilometers per hour. Then this would mean he's, he drives or he moves two meters per synthetic aperture. And then it causes a deep shadow area and a shadow smearing area on the target edges. And the W band has the advantage that we, that we already have a high a backscattering signal from asphalt or from streets. And that's why we can track shadows on street really nicely. I can show you this here. So this time we had a measuring campaign about the roundabout traffic. And all those black shadows that are moving, these are moving cars. For example, here there's, there's a larger shadow that's a bus coming. And you can even see here the signature of the bus. And the signature of the bus, well, it's more or less running running around uh, because the bus changes its orientation and the, 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 the um, sensor changes the orientation, so you can't really get it. But you can track 
the cars where they are driving. You can see, well, this, this car wants, wants to go to the gasoline station. This one is driving to the parking station. You can even see here a car parking. Um, you can track where the guys are all going. Two of them are going straight ahead. One of them is going left. And where you, you see he's driving in front and backwards. And this car will probably park, park here. So you can really capture all the dynamics in the scene. So that's pretty much more information than just uh, an image in linear SAR mode. So here again, tracking of persons. I asked some colleagues just to go in a square on a grass field, and we are able to even capture uh, walking persons if the background is, is okay. If the background is perfectly dark, then of course I can't see them, but on grassland, that makes no problems to track persons. Here again, a sequence of images, um, just to show you the dynamics again. You have two cars, the red, red one is parking, the other one is driving by, and you see at five seconds, the red one is slowing down, the signature arrives, at five seconds he stands still, the signature is exactly at the target's position. Then two seconds later, he's slowing slightly backwards, so the signature goes to the opposite direction, of course, negative Doppler. Then at nine seconds, he's still, if he's in focus, he's standing still. And then 15 seconds later, you can see a small shadow um, leaving that car, which is probably the driver. So I have to hurry a little bit. So let's come to more 3D information or to, to hide information. So our first measurement was to, we would like to detect the, the height information of an object. So, so we said, well, let's adapt the focusing plane to the actual object itself. So instead of just focusing on a, a plane, flat, flat plane model, um, we extract, for example, at this electrical pylon, the GPS position from GIS data of, of, of the special object, then the orientation of the dimension of this object, and then we are able to, to do a focusing plane in this, in this uh, case, a vertical focusing plane, which is adapted to the special object. And then we do a circular measurement campaign, and then you can see how this electrical pylon would, like, would, like, would look like at 94 gigahertz. And if the plane is, for example, if you have this focusing geometry, and if the plane is at this position, you can see nothing. But then, of course, he comes from perpendicular again, and you, you can see the whole dimension of this of this pile in here again. And the main idea was then that we can directly access height information from, from, from the image frames, from the sub-aperture images, because this is simply the, the y-axis of, of these frames. And this corresponds nicely to the 55 meter we get from our laser measurements. So now we're coming to so really 3D extraction. So this research is published two weeks ago, so it should be available on the early access in several weeks. So the basic idea is to evaluate the foreshortening effects, which I showed in the in the video slide, uh, the, the movement of, of objects. And this can be done either by really tracking the backscattering information in, in the consecutive image slides, or you can choose to evaluate uh, the point spread function of, of a scatterer uh, by focusing them on different different height height levels. And that's what I show here, for example. If you have a point at two meter, for example, and the focusing level at two meter, you would produce uh, you would produce this uh, PSF function. And for example, you're two meter below or two meter uh, too high, you will produce this PSF function. And this can be evaluated. So firstly, we, we, we build up a corner field with, I don't know, 12 or 15 corners at different heights, very small corners, only three or four centimeters edge length. And if we apply our methods, we could gain like the height accuracy of about 10 to 20 centimeters using only eight or 10 degrees of aspect integration. So that means for we can we ha just have to fly one circle. We just need 10 degrees, and then we are able to to detect the height of very small objects in an accuracy of about 20 centimeters. 
So going on to more complex scenes. So again, the commercial building area. Here is just the SAR images non-coherently summing up all the aspect angles together. And if we are applying our point spec function analysis method, then you can see that I can generate a 3D point cloud of the whole scene. I've plotted two views of the same scene. Southeastern view, for example, eastern view. Here are the glass houses. Here is the gasoline station. And here are the, the commercial buildings. And you can nicely see that the, the, the roof of the commercial buildings, they are really, really nice because they are, they are filled with roof tiles, which show point-like behavior. But of course, the scatter area or volume scatter area, they are much more challenging than because I don't, do not have an analytical signal there, which I can evaluate. Here again, I fused two, only two views of the central building um, to generate like the dimension of this building. Whereas, for example, here in this view, I fused, I don't know, 10 or 12 views together uh, to get this shadow free point cloud. Here, comparison to LIDAR data. So we had a LIDAR data set of this, of this uh, commercial building site. And here you can nicely see there was a roof area from the main building in LIDAR and in radar. Or here, a profile of all the buildings, uh, LIDAR and radar fusion of three views or fusion of 20 views. And you, you see, of course, well, the sigma gets, gets higher when I fuse more sites together, uh, but the point cloud density gets better, of course. And here you see the glass houses are, are, are bad in the radar because they are partly transparent. So my last slide, uh, quantitative comparison to LIDAR was that we are in the range of, of the LIDAR sensor we, with an accuracy about 20 to sometimes 80 centimeters for just taking the absolute height of these objects. And for smaller objects like, like street lamps, L1 and L2, which I plotted here, right? one street lamp for the radar, one street lamp in LiDAR point cloud. You can't see hardly a really big difference here. There were only 10 or 30 centimeters difference. The sigma here, of course, is much higher for, for the radar. It's, range between 20 centimeter and 50 centimeter. We, we make a, a best fit plane of one of the roofs and we analyzed the sigma for LIDAR and for radar. But what was nice to see that we could detect the angle of incidence of such a roof. From LIDAR it was 15 degrees and from the radar data set it was 15.4 degrees. So, so quite, quite similar. And these are the number of points of this roof area which we analyzed. Yeah, final notes. I just want to say you have, if you do similar research, you have to do a very good track accuracy. You, you have to, the, the, you have to do a DGPS. We spent a lot of effort to detect a nice track. Otherwise, we won't be able to focus the data in this frequency domain. And for the future, of course, we want to combine radiogrammatic method, methods, which we've done yet, with interferometric evaluation to have a second channel to get better height information. Um, we always want to boost our radar, getting higher output power, more data uh, capacity. And of course, we are working to get this all done in, in real time imaging. Yeah, I plotted my last two re uh, research articles here for those who are interested. And um, yeah, you may ask questions and otherwise I would like to thank you for your attention and going back to Jens. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. Um, sometimes very hard to understand if you are not a radar scientist, but um, the truth that it's not uh, so easy to do this. What you do, do what you do. Um, so um, here are some questions. Uh, the first question is: um, Are uh, the data available in real time now at the moment, or what? How many time does it take? that we have the data? Uh, well, this really depends on the resolution you would like. The, the, the data is available in real time, but only in a low resolution. That means one meter resolution. We can process this already on the plane, but the images or videos I showed you in the, in the presentation, they were post-processed, of course. 
because we spend lots of effort to 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 make a good track and this takes some some time. But actually the 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 processing of the video frames is, is really fast. It would take like when I do the post processing, it takes two or three hours to make one such such video. In the VCSAR shadow tracking, you make use of the fact that the asphalt has relative strong backscatter. However, as slant, as slant angle becomes more shallow, the backscatter reduces as more of the reflection is specular, specular right. At what kind of slant angels would this still work, do you think? Also a pretty tough question. Uh, we, we used to uh, have a depression angle of, of about 35 up to 45 degrees, really depending on, on the roll angle of the plane, which we are always correcting. And well, I, I, can, I can only say that we have a relatively strong backscatter signal in our frequency domain. Uh, I, I saw images from KA band where they tracked cars. And of course, that was much more difficult because, because there was much more specular behavior. But we have only tested it in the domain between 35 to 45 degrees depression angle. So more I can't say. <laughs> OK, yeah. Um, next question. Is it possible to make adjustments to the signal processing if we know that the target is not a point scatterer, but rather of distributed type? Yeah, I, I don't see really this, this sense because if it's not a point scatterer, well, nearly all of my targets are no point scatterer. And well, if I would know it's not a point scatterer, of, I, I don't know. I have to think about this. <laughs> okay. Is it possible to mount the system to a drone multicopter? How heavy is the system? Yeah, that's a nice question. We would like to do this as well. So we are planning to have a W band circular drone and the actual system is too heavy. We are at roughly 25 kilograms, especially with with, with the big mount. But um, at the moment for this drone, we are at nine kilograms, but we do not have a gimbal yet. So this this is going to to be done in next next year to to have the first data with the drone. Yes. Oh, great. Um, can you still perform techniques like coherent change detection with the V-band Caesar? <laughs> yeah. That's again a hard question. I've never done it. Um, I tried something coherently in the change detection, but um, I think you can only work in a coherent domain. From, from the focusing side, I see after eight degrees, nine degrees aspect, you will lose coherency with our system. Then you have to, to do some kind of autofocus. And and so I think it's it's pretty hard to do Korean change detection in a, in a large aspect interval. OK, thank you. So um, now here is the last question. Will you please comment on the scene size? Is there a limitation? Yes, I can comment on this. This is rather easy. Um, we are flying at a height of about 300 meter at the moment because of our output power. And I think our angle, our, our antenna angles are 10 or 12 degrees. And so we usually have a full data set in the range of about 150 meters in, in I think in radius or in, you know, the full, full circle is 150 up to 200 meters, which we, which we have full, full, full 3D, but then of course, we have on the border, we have some data, but this is not really three, uh, 360 degree. So we are planning to, to double the output power of our system so that we can fly at least 100 meters higher. And then we are probably in the range of, I think at least 250 meter in, in dimension. Okay, 
here that was not the last question. Here's another question. Can you briefly summarize the challenges of SAR processing at high frequency V band, W band, compared to low operation frequency and your approach to solve these problems? <laughs> yeah, again, a very long question. Um, I think the most difficulties is, of course, um, the coherency, the phase stability, because here we are talking about three millimeter wavelengths. And even if we have only a small, a small synthetic aperture in length, we are talking here about, I would say, 10 to 50 meters is our synthetic aperture, but it's still challenging to process it co coherently. And then, of course, um, using FMCW system, you, you have to you have to um, apply all the micro dopplers there um, and at W band they're of course higher than at, at X band. So and well, <laughs> I think that's that that's the first answer I, I can give. Yeah. OK, yeah, you know what you're doing. That's the main point. <laughs> so that was uh, the questions that were the questions. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for your attention and for taking the time for our presentation. Tomorrow morning we'll receive a small survey about how you liked our presentation. We would be happy if you would take a few minutes to answer it. Next week we have our last lecture of our online lecture, lecture series Radar in Action in 2020, but it will a special edition. Uh, we will broadcast live from our space observation radar Tyra. So if you have not registered yet, do so now. And we are working also currently um, hard on the program for 2021, but you still have to be patient. We will probably not publish it until of the next year. So goodbye. And see you again next week inside the ball. Bye. Thank you.